stay hungry, stay foolish. Now on the Innovation Show, we welcome Nir Eyal, author of Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. Welcome to the show, Nir. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Yeah, so I, I read your fantastic book. I'm a follower of your blog, and I just thought your work is so important for people working in digital media, innovation, anybody who's building products today need to understand you. what you do. Um, so I'm just going to open up the, the mic to you, man, and just you, you know let us know about the process of building habit-forming products. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's something that I thought was very important, too. And in fact, my, my story is that uh, I've, I've helped start two companies that were acquired uh, since then. And, and uh, after my last company was acquired, I, I had some free time on my hands, and I was trying to figure out what I would do next. And I, I just came up with this thesis that habits were really going to matter. This This was back in 2012. And uh, I could tell that the trajectory of where things were going were that uh, things are, you know, digital technologies are becoming smaller and smaller. And as the real estate shrinks, meaning, you know, the amount of room we have to give people visual cues is is decreasing with every shrinking screen size. So when we went from desktops, right, big screens on desks, to laptops, to mobile, to then wearable, and now in terms of audible interfaces, what we've seen is that the interface has completely disappeared, right? With Amazon Alexa and with uh, Siri, uh, what's happening is that the interface is disappearing. So what that means is if you can't create a user habit, if you can't be top of mind, if you can't be the first to mind solution, you don't exist. And so that means that, that companies really have to start thinking about how do they form habits? How do they create associations in people's minds so that they become the product that, that people think of first before the competition? Yeah, so the human factor has become so important because when people build products, they think of things and building things, but they forget about the end user and that this needs to be built for somebody, a person, and the value systems of that person at the end of the, at the, end of the line. Right, and, and also the psychology of the kind of value that even the user can't tell you they need. I mean, that's, that's the thing. I think you know, a lot of us have, have smartened up about how to build products, and we, we no longer just build what the highest paid person, the hippo, says we should build. We don't build what the investors say we should build. That's not how the, we do things anymore. We do customer development. We talk to customers. We listen to what they need. The problem is, of course, that customers have all these inarticulatable needs, meaning things that they need their products to do, but they can't tell you they need it. Why? Because they, they, these needs are these deep psychological needs like loneliness, uh, satisfying boredom, uh, fatigue, uncertainty. You know, Nobody can tell you, you know, I'd really love a product to alleviate my boredom because I feel lonely. Well, that's exactly what Facebook does. <laughs> yeah. But of course, a customer couldn't tell you they needed that product. Yeah, because it's interesting because when I, I read your book, uh, I thought also of uh, Clayton Christensen and his his concept of what do you hire a product to do? And right, I was thinking the if job you put, to be done. Yeah, the job to be done. And I, I, I thought, you know, that, that putting your work as a, as a layer on top of that work. Yeah, I still kind of chew on it. You know, I'm not, I, I, I have the utmost respect for Clayton. Uh, you know, I think he's, he's influenced the field so much. I, I, I love his work. But I'm still chewing on that that concept. It's clear, you know, the, the what's so powerful about that model is, you know, he, he gives this classic example of people don't want to hammer, they want the hole in the wall that it creates so that they can hang their picture. Yes, exactly. Right. So that's why they want the hammer. But then, you know, you even go a step further. Well, why? You know, like if you keep asking why, you actually realize that when if you keep going enough levels of depth, really the only reason we buy anything, anything, is to modulate our mood. It's to provide a psychological relief. What we really want from that hammer is to ease the wanting of the job. Not the job itself, but the wanting of the job, the, the annoyance of that job not being done. And I think the reason I bring that up is because when you think in that frame of mind, you actually open yourself up to thinking about, well, how else could we satisfy that? Does it have to be a picture on the wall that, that I, I hang up with this hammer? Is there other things that might satisfy that person in cr ways I haven't yet considered? So, you know, I, I think it's even imperative to go deeper than just the job to be done, but also 
what's the psychological itch that I'm going to scratch? Yeah, so asking the right questions. So beyond right. the beyond the hiring, and then and, and that kind of leads nicely into your framework. So your your trigger, action, reward, activation um, framework that you mm-hmm. you talk about in Hooked. Can we talk about that? Sure, sure. Yeah. So the 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 ultimate goal of a habit forming product is to build an association to create a memory with an internal trigger. Internal triggers are things that prompt the user to action that tell us what to do next. But the information for what to do next is stored in the user's head. And the most frequent internal triggers are these negative emotions like fear, boredom, uncertainty, fatigue, loneliness. All of these things, we look for relief from these negative emotional states, what we call uh, negative valence states in psychology. So we constantly look to figure out how to take us out of that discomfort. And we use products and services to satisfy that discomfort. Uh, So when I'm lonely, I check Facebook or maybe Tinder. Uh, When I'm uncertain, I go on Google. When I uh, am bored, maybe I'll check the news. I'll check stock prices, sports scores. All of these things cater to these painful internal triggers. Now, what we want to do as product designers is to figure out what's our itch and does it occur frequently enough in the user's life for us to attach to. And so the, the time span is about a week or less. That the more frequently someone uses the product, the more likely they are to form a habit. But really, the cutoff is about a week's time or less. That's how frequently you need people to engage if you want to change their habits. So after we figure out the internal trigger, then we figure out the action. The action is the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. And that could be something as simple as scrolling on Pinterest or pushing the play button on YouTube uh, or a quick search on Google. All of these things are very simple, solitary behaviors in anticipation of an immediate reward. Then comes the reward itself, and typically it's not just a reward, it's a variable reward, meaning there's some kind of uncertainty, some kind of mystery around what I might find or how this product helps me gain agency and control over an inherently variable situation. We can talk more about variable rewards, the fascinating part of, of the hook model. And then finally, the investment phase, this is probably the most overlooked of the four steps of the hook, the investment phase is where the user puts something into the product to bring themselves back in the future. And they do that by storing value. And this is why I'm so excited about the prospect of technology changing all our lives today is because unlike things in the physical world, uh, things made out of atoms like your chair, your desk, your clothing, all of these things depreciate, right? They lose value with wear and tear. But habit-forming products, the miracle of these habit-forming products is that they should get better with use. And that's a really big deal. That's never been possible before. So when I, the more I use Facebook, the more I use Pinterest, Instagram, WhatsApp, Slack, any of these products, either in consumer web or in the enterprise, the good ones get better the more you use them. And that's really amazing. And so that's that fourth principle of the hook model. The investment phase is what loads the next trigger. It brings the user back and it stores value over time. And that through successive cycles through these four steps, this is how customer preferences are shaped and how tastes are formed. And and then you get to the internalization phase. So when this happens, then it just be it's 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 internalized and it's a habit. Exactly, exactly. So that eventually, uh, what's amazing about these habit forming products is that you almost never see them spending a lot of money on expensive ads, right? You 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 don't see. Uh, Facebook and Twitter and Slack and uh, Instagram and Snapchat, you don't see these guys advertising in the Super Bowl uh, because you know they're, they're, they're worth billions of dollars, these companies, and yet you, you, know, you don't really see them spending much money on advertising because they're not changing our minds through ads like you know, the, the brands of yesteryear would have, like Exxon and Geico and you know, uh, Mar- Marlboro cigarettes. You know, they, well, the only tool they had was uh, the, the exposure, right? using the mere exposure effect. Uh, to change our preferences. But these companies do it in a, in a much different way. The experience itself is what changes our minds, what forms these habits. Yeah, and can we, can we talk about the mere exposure effect, just to explain to the audience what that is near? Sure. So the mere exposure effect is why advertising works. Uh, that the more times you see a brand, uh, the more you will like it. For no other reason for the fact that you have seen it before, that you've been exposed to it. Uh, I mean, this in a nutshell explains Donald Trump. For all the the, the uh, prognosticating around why Donald Trump is succeeding, uh, let me tell you, this is why. It's because the public has seen his name, uh, and it's a great brand. I mean, what a great brand uh, to Trump is 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 you know just such a, a great brand name. 
the public has been exposed to this brand name for decades uh, on buildings. Uh, you know, there's a reason that Donald Trump understands to put his name as big as he possibly can on every building to, uh, to watch him on The Apprentice. He, in, in many people's minds, uh, is a brand uh, that they like simply for, because they have seen it millions of t- or maybe hundreds of thousands of times in their life, the same way that we like Coca-Cola over Pepsi or like uh, one brand of gasoline over the other or one sports team over the next is uh, significantly influenced just because we have seen that effect, that, that brand again and again and again. It's really interesting because you talk about this actually even for networking. For, for if, I, if I'm actually a sales guy or I'm into networking, that I need to go to these events and be seen at those events because that mere exposure effect happens with people as well. So you're seen at the event, people are more likely, as long as you're not, you're, you're not a, a total uh, jackass, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you, you're a nice person and you're at these yeah. events, you're just your presence and, and going, oh, that's that guy. And it, he, he represents this, that you become a brand in yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, in, in a way, yes. It, it, the problem, of course, is that it's not scalable. Right, that you you can only go to so many events and see so many people. I think what we see uh, with the internet is that when you when you use something like content marketing, right? When you what the way I built my business, uh, well, I, not intentionally, but what's happened is because I kept writing my blog consistently and sharing my thoughts. Some of them are are bad, and I've changed my mind on some things. But sometimes I write something that that that's good and lasts. Uh, the fact that the the internet can spread good content for me. Uh, is amazing, right? I get all that that mere exposure, uh, you know, for free. Essentially, I don't have to pay for advertising. Now, what would be even better than that is to build a product that doesn't even rely on mere exposure. If you think about how all the companies I described earlier, what they do, it's not the exposure to the brand itself that that makes us uh, habituated to these products. It's the fact that using it creates a habit, uh, and that's eminently scalable. Yeah, because I was thinking about the trigger, and and you know unbeknownst to many people those triggers are are built into the product so when you see a little one symbol or two symbol or a little red dot to to signify that there's been some action on your social feed or your twitter you talk about twitter and how they're actually built to drag you in and to actually give you a trigger every single time and push notifications being a fantastic trigger Sure. Yeah. So those are examples of external triggers. They tell the user what to do next with some bit of information. So that would be something like a, a push notification, an email, an SMS, even word of mouth. Uh, all of these things are examples of, of external triggers. And, and can we talk, Nir, your, your background, because it's really interesting. You've, 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 you've set up and you've sold on companies. Can we talk about you for, for a moment? And Because I think it's interesting in that you know, a lot of startups don't have this psychological understanding of, of the, the mere exposure effect, the different triggers, habit-forming products, and your, your kind of melting pot of bringing that into a startup world or a technical world or a digital media world is really interesting. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So my, my background is that, you know, I didn't start out as an author. I, I started out as an entrepreneur and, and uh, helped start and sold two companies. And, um, you know, where my experience come from is that in my last company, I was at the intersection of gaming and advertising. So I was constantly looking at these different um, companies coming and going inside making games and, and, and making ads. And, you know, these are these are two industries that rely upon mind control. I'll be honest with you, right? Advertisers don't spend all that money for their health and gaming companies know exactly what makes you click and what makes you tick better than you understand yourself. And so that's where I really picked up all this, this know-how. Um, what was frustrating to me is that I didn't see any how-to guide. I didn't see any uh, you know, manual out there for how do we actually use this outside those industries. And so that's really the guidebook that I didn't find and that I wanted to write. So that all of us, people building healthy habits, right? How many of your listeners are working on products and services that really, truly could help people's lives if they only use the product? Yeah, and, and it's crazy. That's the problem. It's crazy because you you even see it with medication. People with life threatening disease or illnesses are, are avoid their medication, and you're kind of going, or right. or somebody who's got you know diabetes, or somebody who's over obese and is avoiding the gym. Because I, I thought about this beyond the product, and I thought about it actually from a gym a gym perspective. So even as simple as going to the gym. If you, if you build a habit using your framework, 
So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and building and stuff like doing at the same time every day, having a reward like lunch even afterwards, um, that, that it actually sticks. Yeah, it's it's it, it's it's tricky. It's not it's not simple to do. Uh, the the real you know what you want to be careful of is you don't want to make the behavior something that people do only for an extrinsic motivator. Extrinsic motivators are things that have nothing to do with the key behavior itself. So the classic example is that uh, when you tell children uh, that you'll they'll get a reward, they'll get candy if they draw a picture. Uh, they tend to draw really crappy pictures uh, because the only reason they're doing it is because they want to get the reward. Uh, but the children who do it for the sake of enjoying the drawing actually draw much better pictures. So that's the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. And so what we want to be very careful of is, is not to uh, motivate a behavior simply because of an extrinsic motivator. What we want to do is to find something that's inherently pleasurable, right? That's the best. Like, Socializing, for example, is something that, that humans love. We have always loved for 200,000 years since our species first evolved. We are a social species. So interacting with one another on these social networks uh, is something that we naturally crave and we find rewarding. Uh, so that's, that's always the best place to look, is to look for things that people do already off offline and then make, bring them online to make them easier, uh, faster, better. Yeah, because that, that, that is a point I love, Nir, because if you think about corporate culture or any kind of company and you think about the the values or the value systems of those companies or the carrot for somebody yeah. to perform and, and that's why you see startups so driven because they're usually intrinsic motivators right instead right. of like Absolutely. a bonus or you know i'm working purely to get my paycheck great point i mean if you're starting a business for the, for you know to be the next mark zuckerberg or because you want a lot of money uh, then you're just bad at math because the odds are horrible that that will actually happen for you. Uh, like, have you any advice for that? So, so if I'm if I'm in a, a fledgling company and I'm about to scale up, I'm in that fortunate position where I've got there. How to build a company for today's world or today's mindsets that that use intrinsic motivators? Yeah, I, I think it starts with you know a unique uh, perspective that you have. I think the the, the best hack that I don't think people think about enough is that you really need to build something for yourself. That, you know, as you, as you mentioned before, you, you have to think about your own intrinsic motivation. So if the only reason you want to do a startup is because you want to get rich, that's just a dumb reason to start a, a company. Your, your chances are, are minuscule. However, if you start a product or service because you want the product, right, you are the user, you want the thing that you're going to build, that's a great reason to build a company. Uh, that's something that you can do in your nights and weekends. You don't have to quit your job. Uh, you can work on that product. You can build it. It's easier than ever to learn how to code, to learn how to design. I mean, all that knowledge is out there. The only thing missing is your will to actually make it happen. Uh, so that's my advice is to you know use the competitive advantage that you have of knowing what the customer wants by being the customer, right? You be the user. And if you look at the pattern of all the companies that we admire over the past you know, five to 10 years, Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Slack, Snap, all of these companies were founded by people who follow that formula. They were building products for themselves first. Yeah, and it's interesting because we, we did an interview with Dennis Mortensen, um, the founder of X.ai, and uh -huh. he, he, he told me, what he does is he keeps a hate list, things that just yeah. annoy him so badly that he wants to fix them. And then he comes back to that list. And one of the things was sorting out his inbox, sorting out uh, his diary. And he created Amy and X.ai yeah. out of that need. And, and it's so true that because you become your best customer and then you're obviously able to represent the product better than anyone right. else as well. Exactly. Because you know, coming across user insights is so difficult to try and build a product for someone else. Not impossible. People can do it, of course. Uh, but I, if you have the opportunity to build for yourself, I would always take that opportunity first. Yeah. And, and so one of the things I thought was really interesting that you talk about is freemium models. So you talk about game gaming when obviously your background in that, that, mm -hmm. you know, these 30 day trials that they all happen to be around 30 days. Uh, yes, it's a month, but also it's the time around it needs to, to create a, uh, a habit. Um, right. Can we talk about that? Because somebody, we have a lot of companies listen to the show who, who are SaaS products. And right. The, the seven day or the 14 day or 28 day trial, have you any tips around that to build it into a habit? Right. So the idea is that you want to form that habit. You want to make sure you pass people through the four steps of the hook model, the trigger, the action, the reward, investment, so that by the time it becomes a habit, 
now they have to pay, right? This is Slack's story, right? When the more people invested, but when they got through the four steps and ended up with the investment phase and invited other people, connected APIs, then it became something that they needed, right? It suddenly became a painkiller versus a vitamin, and that's the trick. That's why we would want to do this. We want to show people how valuable the product is for a given period of time, and once they form that habit, now uh, it's so valuable to them that they'll be glad to pay. That's a that's a great line, a painkiller versus the vitamin. I love that. Um, <laughs> that I, but so, because one of the, the, the I don't think people really, when I told people about the investment, I don't think they really got that. And, and I was saying like, it's like, almost like YouTube being user generated content that the more you upload, it's almost like a network effect, the better it is for everybody on that platform. Or it's like Amazon, the more sellers or and buyers you have, the better it is for everyone. That that's right. a, that's a type of investment as well. Exactly, absolutely, investment in the network effect. Yeah, and because because there's a couple there's a couple of pieces of the pie now coming together. We talked about you know the the Clayton Christensen asking the right questions. We talked about psychology of what what problem you're solving, um, uh -huh. and we talked about your hook model. And then if you actually add in the network effect, there I was just thinking of a framework. And if you look at those four elements uh, as a whole. And then you just concentrate on, okay, this is my framework, and now I'm going to work on actually creating a kick-ass product. That, that's, that's a good framework. It's a good starting point. Sure, sure. I mean, the, the point of the hook model is to save you a lot of time, money, and heartache building the wrong thing. Uh, so instead of you know hiring a designer and, and coding and doing all that work up front, which is what people typically do, they get all excited and, and start spending a lot of money on stuff, you know, all you have to do is take out a pen and paper, and with this hook model, you can evaluate, look, if my business model requires people to come back on their own, if that's a requirement for my business to stay alive, then do I have the four basic elements of the hook, the trigger, the action, the reward, and the investment? And that, that's, that's, that's worth its weight in gold, right? If you can look at that and say, oh my gosh, this is never going to become a habit because we're missing one of these four requirements, terrific, great, kill your product, move on to the next thing, and don't waste your life. And if you say, wow, we do pass, there's a high chance here. Okay, great. Now we're going to invest in, in actually uh, doing some prototyping. Yeah, and, and even the investment, like you mentioned, uh, Slack, but it, it can be as much as uploading uh, data, like so your, your CSV of your contact base and then inviting people so they start using it. And it's that kind of, it's that kind of thought process as well beyond your own personal investment. It's actually, as you said, plugging in APIs, that you end up, um, you end up kind of getting so embedded in the product that you can't leave it. Right. Exactly. Right. The more you invest, the more it becomes a, a painkiller. Yeah. So, near, I'm just wary of your time. We committed to twenty minutes. The book is fantastic. It's available on Amazon. That's where I got it. And your your blog as well, nearandfar.com. Right. Exactly. Nearandfar.com. Near is spelled like my first name, N-I-R. Nearandfar.com. And actually, if you subscribe to my blog, then I give you a workbook. Uh, that's a supplement to Hook that, that kind of walks you through how to build habit-forming products uh, in that free workbook. Okay, well, Nir, uh, really appreciate your time, and it's been a, a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, Nir EL, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now on the Innovation Show, we welcome Ronan Higgins and Peter Onk, founders of TV AdSync. Welcome to the show. Hey, Dan Hayden. Hey. Right, so welcome to the show, guys. We'll jump straight into it. So your your story, we met actually just when you guys started. That's right. And it's it's a great product and it's evolved massively. We're going to steer we're steer clear of the word pivot, we promised it. But uh, it's evolved massively. Yeah. Um, and it's become a product that you've really stumbled upon from the work you started out with. Yeah. So we'd love to hear how it happened. Sure. I mean, I, I think if, when we first met was two years ago, I think it was, and um, we were pitching around our basic product, which was and still is based around live TV ad airing information. So uh, we were able to detect when TV ads air and then use that information to trigger short bursts of online advertising. Um, basic idea is that people were sitting at home watching TV. They had their phones or smartphones in their hands. TV show would cut to ads. The first ad would come up and uh, then they'd jump on their phone. And if you could just get this, the same advertiser onto the phone at that moment in time, the power of the TV ad would influence people to click on the digital ad on their smartphone or tablet or even laptop. A lot of people use laptops while they're watching TV. And it was, you know, it's a great concept. And we tested it out and we got some um, support from some of the ad agencies here in Dublin to run a control study and were able to prove that there was a statistically valid uplift in clicks 
on ads as a result of doing them within a short window of time from the TV ad. And uh, that was great. That's what we pitched to, I think, a couple of mm. years ago. Um, but as we started to expand out of Ireland and look into uh, other markets, especially the US market, we uh, recognized that the model might not adapt to other markets, especially the US. Uh, we were over in New York last April, I think it was April. Yeah, April. Yep. And um, one of the agencies basically said, guys, we can see how this works in Europe, but it's not going to work here because the TV audience is spread across a far greater number of channels. And they were right. You know, they were absolutely right. And you might have to explain that the probability of finding somebody in front of the TV watching their smartphone at the same time is quite likely uh, when you have three main channels. But in the US, you have 300 channels. So the likelihood drops, that drops down to uh, single digit percentages of being gotcha. able to reach yeah. the same person. So the scale, the scale and fragmentation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which affects the probabilities of a person being delivered a uh, digital ad actually being tuned to the right channel at the right time. Yeah. Uh, European markets are, are good because each market tends to have a, um, a dominant national channel. So Ireland especially has RT1, RT2 and TV3, which would command almost 50% of primetime ratings. So you know that if a TV ad airs on RT1 at 8.30 p.m., uh, that 20% of the population have actually been exposed to that ad. And that means 20% of the people who are on their phone, if you give them the same ad on their phone or something relevant to the ad, 20% are actually relevant to the, to the cross-screen experience. Whereas in the States, if you're watching even the primetime highest rating show, um, you might get a 7% rating. So the, st the statistics just aren't, aren't as solid. And for most TV audiences in the US, it's like a 1% to 2% rating, 1% to, 1, 1 to 2 rating. So the model doesn't make sense. What's the point in buying cabillions of impressions across the whole of the US if uh, you don't have people actually watching the show you're trying to the seek country. against? Yeah, and it's interesting because on, on the, the work involved, I mean, that, that was no mean task taking on the, the kind of setup you had to do because you had to link into the ad serving networks mm. that the agencies would mm. use because the publisher may use a different one from the agency, he might use a third party one to measure what the publisher is doing. Yeah. And uh, to, to synchronize that yeah. is a lot of work. Yeah. Like, and you have to know then the ad times, the schedule yeah. times as well. So you need to link into another one. And, and I suppose yeah. it's, an, it's, a, it's a kind of a pulling together of all those different platforms that is the product or was the product. Yeah, it, it, it was definitely technical. Yeah, it, it goes it goes actually a step deeper than that. Um, yes, we did kind of put things together uh, in a in a very sort of improvised manner. So we, yeah, you you need broadcast monitoring. You need to see what's happening on live TV. So we installed servers and put uh, software on them to recognize what is happening in, in live TV. We started uh, using a demand side platform to buy ads that were triggered. What's by a demand side platform? Oh, sorry, Peter? yeah, demand side platform. <laughs> jargon, <laughs> jargon, <laughs> jargon, jargon. Yeah. Enables oh, <laughs> the wrong sp sound effect. Um, <laughs> this is a, this is a three letter acronym: uh, free zone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, we get extra bonus points for throwing in. DSP, uh, yeah, uh, DSP. throw that in there. I know um, what it means. Sorry, I'll, I'll explain. <laughs> um, advertisers can buy advertising in real time for online for mobile devices for uh, uh, for tablets, and uh, one would use a DSP for that. Uh, so configure a campaign to target males uh, between the age of 25 and 45 for, let's say, a Gillette ad. And a campaign would be configured to start uh, on the Monday, or the first Monday of a month, and run for a month. And we would kind of... Uh, do that slightly differently. We configured campaigns to not be running, but only run when a TV ad appeared. So it was just kind of changing the, the idea oh. of when an ad would appear on a smartphone or a tablet. And at the same time, some competitors started popping up in Germany and in France, and they raised bucket loads of money to, to roll out across their home market. And their home market, obviously, is 80 million people in the case of Germany, and Ireland is 4 million people. So we didn't have the scale in our home markets, so basically needed to find a way to do it better, which when we went to the US, we, we did. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, and uh, it took a long time to really work out how we would improve the product. But if, if it was complex, bringing the publishers and the demand side platforms and the advertising uh, components of the ad tech stack together in combination with broadcast monitoring technology, it suddenly got very complex trying to do something more sophisticated uh, in the US. And we spent about a half a year researching, would it be possible to source or acquire data on a household level that would tell us when a specific household had been exposed to a specific TV commercial? <clears throat> and it's something you might think is kind of obvious if you've grown up in the internet generation where when you go onto YouTube on your laptop, you know that YouTube knows that you have been exposed to a specific piece of content 
But in the broadcast industry, that really hasn't existed. There's no, there hasn't been a back channel on on broadcast. When the, when the broadcaster broadcasts an ad for Ford, they know it's going out to millions of homes, but they don't know which homes. Um, so we were looking for a way to <clears throat> get that kind of data. And we started off by talking to the cable providers, uh, cable operators, or MVPDs, to get your four-letter acronym in there. <laughs> Ka-ching. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we were looking at set-top boxes. You know, yeah. was there a way that a set-top box might be able to reveal in real time that a specific household had been exposed to a specific commercial? And we knew that set-top boxes had some legacy middleware or technology on them for interactive TV services, the red button stuff you get on Sky in the UK. And in the US, a lot of the uh, cable providers had had interactive services. And the more we researched it, the more we just couldn't work out, you know, are these guys capable of sending any signal back up their pipes to some central place or even to us directly, that we'd be able to sort of recognize that a TV commercial exposure moment happened. And then more through fortuitousness than anything else, uh, an old co-worker of Peter's happened to have joined a slightly obscure company in San Francisco uh, who pitched themselves as a smart TV interactivity content recognition platform. Okay. And for months, we were sort of sitting there looking at the website going, I'm not too sure what they do, to be honest. <laughs> And then one day the penny dropped and we said, actually, hold on, these guys must be using their recognition technology in the television set to recognize when a piece of piece of content hits the glass. And Peter reached out to his old co-worker and said, listen, what are you working on? Because this is what we're working on. Yeah. So it turns out that they uh, had built technology that sits in the TV and samples the screen every few seconds to work out what something is and therefore creating a stream in real time of what a TV is showing on the glass. So, so a visual recognition almost, wow. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we kind of just explored how we could use that, and it turns out that uh, they were building a, a large infrastructure to work with a number of TV manufacturers that would license their technology to create a real-time stream of what each household is exposed to in real time. So we said, well, that's all fantastic, but what we need to know is when a TV spot airs, uh, because when you go into content, it's a little bit tricky if you start matching households' data with what somebody is watching. Some people don't want the general public to know that they might be watching <clears throat> something on telly. On telly. So when you say content, you mean programming, programming the actual, the actual show. Mm -hmm. And there are different types of programming that people might be nervous about sharing their uh, viewing habits of. <clears throat> Even though it's completely anonymous, remember that. <laughs> yes, of course it is, of course it is. Um, but what we basically tried to work out with them is can we uh, learn in real time when an ad from one of our clients appears on a TV? And it turns out that that was one of the use cases that they had thought of initially, but never really explored. So we uh, kind of built that relationship over time. And um, about six months into the into the relationship, we heard a rumor that they were being acquired by the TV manufacturer. And this is at the time, the number two selling TV brand in the US. So wow. all of a sudden we were talking to this obscure company day one, and day two we're talking to this large TV multinational. So it was kind of ridiculously fortuitous, serendipitous, that's, if you will. That's because uh, it's, it's, when you think about getting closer and closer to the distribution pipe, people, yeah. like, I mean, that's where the, the medium or the gold is when you think about Facebook, we're publishing, et cetera. And it's like, we own distribution, we own the customer yeah. relationship essentially. Yeah. And the TVs getting into that just totally makes sense because people talk about the future of, you know, smarter cars and, you know, in that world of the smart car, who owns the radio in the car? Yeah. The car manufacturer. Yeah. The car manufacturer could get into serving their own ads to their own network, especially if you get to driverless cars or autonomous cars when people are buying less cars and your Halo and your, your Ubers are driven by AI. Why do you need a car? Do you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you, it just becomes an on-demand uh, platform. Yeah. So they're going to have to replace that revenue stream somewhere. So it's something that totally resonates with me, Peter, is that that mindset of getting closer to the customer or a new revenue stream th to replace a, a defunct one. Well, well t talking about rev revenue stream, what had actually gone on with this company, well, the, the original company was called Cognitive. Uh, they had the core intellectual property around visual recognition on the glass of the TV set. They got acquired by uh, Vizio Televisions, which was at the time number two, I think they're number one in sales in the US now. And Vizio had been a discount or has been a, a discount TV uh, vendor. So they're in Costco and uh, Kmart and Walmart and all the big box retailers. But their, their business is a very thin margin business. I mean, they, they think they get a 2% margin out of each TV they sell. So if you're selling a $400 TV, not much actually being made per sale. 
Um, but it's, at the same time, they're still a $2 billion company um, in terms of sc- actual scale per year. Um, but they, very soon after they acquired the company that we'd been talking to, uh, they announced that they were going to do an IPO or they wanted to do an IPO. And their S1 filing revealed that their whole vision for the future and their whole purpose for doing an IPO was that they recognized that there really wasn't that much money to be made in selling TVs, uh, but there's money to be made in having an ongoing a revenue stream from a television as a result of the data that it can generate about viewing patterns, viewing propensities, householders, different kind of bits and bytes that you can pull out of it. But in order to do that, the TV had to know what it was actually presenting. And if you think about it, historically, TVs have been pretty dumb. Even smart TVs have actually been pretty dumb. They actually just don't know what they're presenting on the screen. So there's, there's kind of a tectonic change now happening as a result of, of this uh, new content recognition capability of, of at least the Vizio TVs. And we approached them saying, we have this business where we help advertisers target online ads to people who've been exposed to TV commercials. Can we leverage or partner with you to license this data so that we can actually do household granular targeting of this to kind of leapfrog our competitors and to bring into the market something that's much more sophisticated and much more in tune with what the agencies want? And they said, yeah. Uh, so we've been working with them uh, since April, delivering campaigns into the US market. But we've well, even since April, it's now August, almost mm-hmm. September, We've already learned that there's a whole slew of other applications that we can actually tap into that leverage this data. And so we're seeing a situation where 50 years of TVs being dumb. Now one manufacturer's got really smart TVs in the sense that they know what they're displaying. And here and now the company's actually going out and doing licensing deals for the tech with other manufacturers who we can't mention. Um, so we can see a situation where we're going to be able to access data from more and more TVs. Right. I do need to emphasize at this stage that it's all anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know who you are or where you are. Um, so um, we just uh, basically uh, uh, target people based on anonymous identifiers. Yeah, and um, fr- from a, like, I mean, from an ecosystem perspective, that totally changes the game yeah. because now you are you've got a distribution of your own product essentially across the, by partnership. Because yeah. I mean, w- when we spoke back then a lot of people didn't understand what you're doing or they understood that initial product but didn't understand how to scale it. Yeah. And you guys have just managed to, you know, and, you know, you talk about being lucky but you brought yourself to the table. You were at the table because you had the product so luck doesn't really exist. You yeah. did a lot of hard work and, you know, you, you rolled the dice for yourselves. Yeah. And that's totally changed the game but it must be frustrating in the early ga- days of this where you've brought this technology to some companies and they don't know really what you're talking about because they're probably dealing with the business today as opposed to seeing what it can be tomorrow. Yeah, that can, that can be frustrating. Um, and uh, it's definitely a an, an issue when you're trying to get off the ground as a startup. Um, most startups have very limited runway and very limited resources, so they have to bring in revenues quickly. And yeah, there's a, there's a sort of an inaction, and maybe I can say this because I'm not Irish, but in, in in Ireland it might be even worse. But people feel that they're kind of hanging on to their um, their existing business, and they are afraid to adjust or adopt uh, new thinking. And that's that's probably what prompted that that uh, uh, that pivot on our on our part that we just wanted to go and do it elsewhere. Yeah, and because it, it, it's we see this all the time with innovation that people are dealing with the business as it is today. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you just don't have the right people for the business tomorrow. And people are hanging on to that and they're kind of going, I, I don't really want to change because that exposes my lack of knowledge instead of absolutely jumping and embracing it. And yeah. that needs to come from the top of companies and yeah. needs to be bred into the companies that you need to investigate this. You need to get in early. There's actually another aspect to it. And that is particularly in, in Ireland is problematic is that it's really hard <coughs> to get to a no. In Ireland, if you're in <laughs> in the Netherlands uh, or in Germany, and you present what you have, somebody will go, yeah, but no, yeah. And here it's a that's great, uh, yeah. Come back next month, yeah. And then you come back the next month, and it's come back in two months. Uh, yeah. So it's just really hard to get to a no. I mean, yeah. a no is often even better than a yes yeah. because it means you can move on. And a, and a no with some feedback as to why is even better. Yeah. But like what you want is a Tinder. <laughs> you want to just be swiped one way or the other. <laughs> The tar- startup Tinder, that's a great idea. Pitch Tinder. In- innovation dating, yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah. so what's next? Um, scale, scaling. Uh, so we, we've found ourselves in the 
lucky position of being primed for what's becoming a new media product, essentially, and being primed in the leading media market in the world. So there's an opportunity on the table there in front of us. We only have two competitors. Uh, we need just to scale into the market and grow with our partners as well. So the next year is all about the US. Um, that being said, uh, we know that some of this capability of, of smart TV being really smart recognition is coming online in Europe as well. And we're already being asked because we're <coughs> Europeans. <laughs> That's the way we pitch it anyway. Um, we're already being asked, you know, how can we take their products to market here? You know, what kind of revenues can we garner from from the European markets? And, and realistically, uh, the American companies... Um, are saying, well, let's start off with the UK and Germany and France. You know, we know they have, they have some decent scale and they're sophisticated enough in terms of their, their marketing and advertising. And then they look at Scandinavia, which is sophisticated as well. And, and then they sort of back their way into the Latin countries that tend to be a few few years behind the uh, the Nordics. Uh, so we're kind of looking at focusing on the US, getting the revenues up as quickly as possible, um, carving out our, our, our portion of the market against our competitors and then expanding the European operation as well. And is there an opportunity for funding then to fund that scale? Or are you are you okay yeah. for the moment? Uh, like every startup, we're always looking for Always funding. open. That's, okay. just, that's, that's just the reality of it. Okay. Uh, we did just close a funding round here in Ireland, uh, supported by Enterprise Ireland as well. Thank you, Enterprise Ireland. Um, but it's just not at scale that we really need. So we're back out talking to investors. Um, there are a few nice hot irons in the fire, irons in the hot fire. Um, so hopefully we'll pull in more funding pretty quickly, actually. And what we've seen ourselves, we've, Peter and myself have actually had a bit of bad luck you know, on a couple of occasions where we've been in the market first, we've had the better product, and we've seen uh, competitors pop up in other markets at bigger scale where the VCs tend to take higher risks and raise the 5 to 10 million euros or dollars uh, and then just take off and if, and usually it's the first person out of the gate even if they're not differentiated they're the first one to get funded which becomes the differentiator yeah. they have the war chest and then when you're second the first question the VC asks you is okay so your competitor has 5 to 10 million in war chest what have you got that's different that's going to crush them and it becomes very difficult then so we're trying to accelerate the process this time around um, by already engaging with American uh, investors um, especially ones that are familiar with marketing technology where MarTech is the industry buzzword okay. is happening. So where can people get in touch for either f- from a funding perspective or, mm. or to find the product and engage with it? With us? Yeah. Oh, uh, Ronan at tvadsync.com. Yeah. But don't add it to your spam list. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter, P-I-E-T-E-R. That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, Peter Onk and Ronan Higgins, f- co-founders of TV Ad Sync. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So now on the Innovation Show, we welcome CEO and founder of WorkChuckle, Kira Garvin. Welcome to the show, Kira. Hi, Aidan. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so I kind of hijacked you into an interview. <laughs> you thought you were coming for a cup of coffee. I thought we were having a cup of coffee, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no better way to, to... So we're having water uh, instead of coffee, yeah. so I'm a cheapskate. Um, t- tell us about the product. Okay, sure. So WorkChuckle, um, I'm kind of a very early stage startup. I have a website, WorkChuckle.com. Um, and uh, what I am trying to build up to is like an online global digital platform whereby companies who are uh, looking for project-based or flexible workings can post their projects and they'll be matched up to a selection of pre-screened candidates who can uh, pitch for the job. So basically, I suppose I'm really interested in kind of the world of work and how that's all changing. Um, and that's why I've been looking into work juggle and launching it. So what, what do you mean by the world changing? So what, what kind of stuff? So AI taking over, you know, road tasks or what, what well, kind of? Well, I think it's more like if you look around, like, you know, the world of our parents, whereby you worked 40 years for the same company, Monday to Friday, nine to five for your whole life. And you got a lovely gold watch and a defined benefit pension scheme at the end of it. Like that's gone, you know, and what's going to replace it? And I think to a certain extent, it's kind of good that it's gone because it didn't suit a lot of people. Do you know what I mean? And I suppose what I'd be looking at, I'd be looking at women as well. You know, it doesn't always suit uh, people for a variety of reasons to be working in that kind of an environment. So um, I think there's some really interesting changes also in terms of how we present ourselves and how comfortable we are sharing information online. So, I mean, I think 15 years ago, if you had talked about LinkedIn and sharing your CV with your photo and people writing recommendations, I think we would have run a mile. But now it's just part of our lives. It's what we do and it's how we sell ourselves. Um, I also think technology has really moved on. So now, and I mean, I've done it myself and you've probably done it as well. Like I've managed a Project Grow Live in my sitting room in Dublin 
with support from India, which is going live in Redmond, you know, in Redmond, Virginia. So like the requirement to be someplace has really changed. Um, and I think that's a really interesting space as well. And also when you look up and you look at the new workforce that's entering, and we talk a lot about the millennial workforce and all that. And I actually think they're great. You know, I really admire the way they're so values driven and experience driven. And I think for them, the thought of having like that kind of a 40 years for life in the same company, I think that's horrifying for them. And I think they're looking to move and change. And particularly people who have like really highly in demand skill sets, there's, an, you know, there's opportunities to do that now. Yeah, it makes sense. We had uh, Kingsley Aikens on the show before as uh, CEO and founder of Diaspora Matters. And Kingsley talked about this and he said, my children will have probably 18 different jobs. And yeah. he said like, so it'll be two year jobs It'll be project based work. Yeah. It will be flexible work. Yeah. Uh, and to some companies like uh, Catawave, where I work, and we're working towards a four, four day work week. Brilliant. And th that's not, I mean, it doesn't mean that's skiving off and having an extra day. It means yeah. actually getting your work done in a much more efficient way, using technology to help you get there. And that's why, like, I, I use Amy, which is an artificial intelligent agent to manage my diary. Brilliant. It saves about three or four hours a day or yeah. a week, which is, you know, and if and you can imagine if I had a lot more meetings, how much time that's me saving me. And there's a huge shift towards the world being on demand almost. So it's, it's like a Netflix world. It's like, yeah. I watch it when it suits me. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is like, um, I had Pauline Cogan, Dr. Pauline Cogan on the, on the show, we we're talking about education. We're mm -hmm. talking about how the education system doesn't cater for every the way everybody learns differently mm -hmm. and yeah. and learning difficulties aside it means some people are visual learners some people are, are memory learners and some people are immersive learners and the world has adapted to that finally yeah. uh, well it hasn't really it hasn't it hasn't got near where it should be but it's exactly same as the workforce and you've identified that as a problem that needs to be solved yeah absolutely and i think um I suppose what kind of started me on all of this as well was, you know, like many people, you know, you're working away, you know, I've worked in large corporations and it's great. But then let's say you have, you know, your third child and you're looking for uh, other opportunities and you say, oh, God, you know, I'd love to work somewhere just three days a week. You know, I think that's what I could do at the moment. But to try and find those organizations that are going to offer you a three day week, I honestly, I think it'd be easier to like Google US military installations like that information would be more readily available. So what I'm part of what I'm trying to do is let's celebrate those companies that have this really great culture. Let's celebrate those companies that are really they're not just have like innovative over the door, but actually we are being really innovative in how we're working and we are really looking at our workforce and our gender diversity and we're really um and those companies are out there. You know, now I'm out, I'm talking to companies and you're starting to see actually, yeah, some people are really far ahead. So let's celebrate them so people know and people can then move accordingly to where those really interesting jobs are. Yeah, it's because it's interesting with the shift in Ireland. So we've we've seen like sometimes I'm envious of startups, you know, because they're not only have they got a product that's relevant for today, mm -hmm. they have set the company up with a workforce that's relevant for today and workflows Ooh, that are relevant yeah. today. While there's so much legacy and you, you know, think about uh, the newspaper industry and they're almost labored with the printing press yeah. and nobody, you know, the printing press is in huge decline, but it goes deeper than that because there's organizational structures and silos in place yeah. that were fit for yesterday's world, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But today's world just doesn't work that way. It's open, it's collaborative, it's innovation, it's innovation as part of the 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 culture of the company and it's inbred into people and they just don't, they don't see it because yeah. it's actually the culture. You know, and that's so interesting. I actually, cause I, um, I just did a review actually on Irish tech news of Gillian Tett's The Silo Effect. And she's talking about how dangerous it is if you live in a silo. You know, the octopus you, spots. Yeah. I did like, a post on it a few oh, weeks ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it was a great book, but I like, you know, you know, like the financial catastrophe of 2008, everyone is doing their job to the best of their ability, but we're all marching off a cliff, you know? And that's why I think it's very important to get different viewpoints in and different ways of looking at things. And, you know, whether that's neurodiversity, whether that's somebody who's coming to the workforce from a different organization, it keeps everything fresh. But I think the challenge with something like Work Juggle is it absolutely has to work for companies as well. It has to be company focused in terms of people have to be coming in with those like high in-demand skills 
you know, really hitting the ground running and it has to it has to work for everyone. So had so so in a, in a way work juggles like a, a matchmaker. So yeah, it's a little, yeah. Demand and supply yeah, side. Exactly. Of, yeah, exactly. And you know, it's so interesting because I think uh, sometimes in London they're a bit further ahead and they're saying like if you advertise a job flexibly, the level of qualifications coming in the door it just flies up in terms of people all of a sudden are looking at it who maybe wouldn't have looked at that job. So Oftentimes you're getting in somebody who's possibly like really highly skilled, but they're looking for that little bit of flexibility. Um, but I think like I'm at a really early stage and I know I've said that to you before we yeah, started, absolutely. like, you know, um, like I have my website, but it's very much like, you know, I built it myself. You know, it's really um, I just finished New Frontiers phase one, hoping to get on to phase two and just really kind of getting a feel for the market and what's out there but so right. far everything's been really positive yeah well i mean you, you've you've certainly hit upon a place that's that's untapped i suppose and like let, let's use this opportunity to 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 put out there what you want so what what's your next step so you've done the new frontiers is is it to build a team is you need funding to build a team yeah i suppose i'm kind of you know i suppose i am like a techie do you know what i mean in terms of like i was in bolton street doing computers like 15 years ago when it was like the least cool thing you could ever do you know and like nerd yeah totally and like there were three girls in the class it was like you know <laughs> yeah, and we totally were all different. complete nerds like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and so now it's kind of funny because technology is all really cool mm. and so I suppose where I see my side is definitely you know I love the technology and what I'm looking to do is I've really started learning a lot about the finance side and how important that is in terms of like really ramping up your growth you know and I've been learning a lot about funding and I think that's where I'm going to be concentrating going forward is trying to get a couple of funders on board who can really see like the huge potential here you know and I think Ireland as well Ireland's in a great location because we have all these great multinationals here We have the highest childcare costs in Europe. So, I mean, there's a real, you know, that's a real pain point here. And um, we have uh, we have some really good EU laws as well in terms of whereby people like my brother in law works a four day week and nobody bats an eyelid anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, so I think we have this really interesting mix of culture, legislative, financial pain point that could really spread from Dublin. Yeah. And it's interesting you said about your brother there, because like I I always found this fascinating that I could come in at 7 a.m. Mm-hmm. or or I could work till 7 p.m. and come in at five past nine. I'd be like, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been here. I'm but I think seven. It, yeah. you know? And that's, I think that's an old school mindset. It is an old school, but it's interesting. You know, I was out um, working on contract over Microsoft there last year and they had a brilliant, you know, I mean, everybody, lots of people worked remotely. I mean, every department is different and all that. But like literally people came in at five in the morning people left at all sorts but like we were all working Focused. strong hours yeah yeah but being at your desk just wasn't important that's one of the few places i've worked where people have said you know it's not important to be at your desk and then really followed up like you yeah know. it wasn't just lip service because uh, there's a really interesting point in that i i found right from experience mm-hmm. that when when a, a mother comes back from maternity leave mm-hmm. that they are so focused and so like they yeah, cut out all effect, the crap. Mega efficient. Yeah, I think they're brilliant. And they're, yeah, yeah. because I suppose f- from experience, when you have children, your life gets broken into 20 minute segments. Like, <laughs> I have 20 minutes, I have 20 minutes, don't waste my time, God damn it. And y- you know, you see that coming into workplace and it's going to go on, do we really need to meet? No, you don't. And yeah. that that's br- the workplace needs more of that meetings for the sake of meetings and meetings about future meetings yeah. is still in a lot of companies. And you're kind of going, Imagine you didn't have to go through all those meetings. And it's yeah. like, it's like, all I want to do is touch my toes. And you're going, here's a fat suit. Now try and touch your toes <laughs> and with the meetings. And it's killing you. And, you know, I find, I really do find uh, maternity uh, mothers who come back from maternity mm-hmm. leave just really, really phenomenally focused. Yeah. And I think like work juggle can facilitate that in the future Absolutely, because yeah. I suppose, you know, if they've changed roles or they're kind of going, you know what, I don't want to do the five day week anymore. Yeah. Three days week is is uh, more effective for me. Yeah. Because again, like there's a lot of face time in, in businesses where they don't need to be there nine to five, but the company's kind of going, well, that's the way we do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think, and so again, like I was talking to Dell there recently, I mean, they had a great program for people coming back and it does make such a difference in terms of having that level of support. We talked about uh, funding. We talked about the the problem, y- your team that you need to put together. So are you, are you, do you need a team of coders or developers? So I'm actually, I suppose because, um, 
I'm very happy with like the outsource model. So I've talked to because that's what I'm used to is like not necessarily working with people um, side by side on a desk. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because yeah. that's just the way IT has gone. Like generally, your team is not in Dublin. So I've talked to a couple of internet companies in Dublin that I think would be really good to build it. And I'm really happy to go with them. And at this stage, I'm just looking for funding just to bring it up to the next level a little bit and I, that's why I suppose I'm kind of waiting to hear back on New Frontiers Phase 2 and just like I really just think there's just such a huge opportunity here yeah. and it's not just for um, candidates but also for employers because a lot of times I mean Dublin like particularly the tech environment like it is really competitive you know like I have been hiring people in and we're hiring people in from abroad even when there's like high unemployment here in Dublin you can be really because you want a specific skill set so and I think also in startups you know they're coming up they have a requirement but maybe they can't afford you know to hire somebody on a full-time basis so yeah. I just think there's this really interesting space at the moment whereby you can really help out employers and the candidates coming through. So, last question for you. So, new frontiers program. So, what what was how was that like? Like, and well, how how did you get? How did you start? Well, I suppose um, I just I put in my application. It was recommended to me, and I actually went down. And I did it in Maynooth and Athlone. Like, I live in Dublin, but they were uh, really kind, and they said they'd <laughs> they'd have me, and uh, I commuted down there to do it. And I just found it great because I love like there are so many people in the room with really cool business ideas with loads of energy who really want to make it happen and then just to you know and then people who are really happy to facilitate you making it happen like it's fantastic I mean like I know for me like I have three kids and you know sometimes it can be hard for people to understand why you would want to take the risk that's what I find like people like often say to me you're mad you're mad why would you do this you're completely mad would you not just retrain and be a teacher or you know what I mean like there's all this or you know oh you're too nice to do that you know why would you do why would you do the hassle why would you take that on yourself whereas when you go and do something like a new frontiers program everybody is like yeah that's the best thing you could ever do same page yeah Yeah. totally everyone's like yeah that's so cool go do that you know and I just think for me and I think for the others in the room like you just get so much out of that energy and like the only thing is you can just see like their ideas like there's some great ideas and there's great um drive and you just really want everyone to succeed yeah that's great and it's kind of birds of a feather yeah you know, uh, and that energy I suppose is just like I, I've been in those moments and you know in bigger companies you put a hackathon together and you put where everybody's energy is pointed in the same direction yeah. is just magical and that's yeah. what and you going back to what we t- you talked about Gillian Tett and the silo effect oh, yeah. like Sony's total failure oh, yeah. was due to everybody's <laughs> energy was pointed in different directions and yeah. where the silo directed and when that does come together in the right right place that really can be magical so so next steps for you is Hopefully, you So at the moment, yeah, and at the moment, I'm um, busy working away and getting funding, and I actually have a potential investor who's interested, and I'm kind of learning on my side on the whole financial side. So, um, and I'm talking to companies, and I'm really interested in talking to companies who are doing it well. You know, I'm all about like let's celebrate those people who are doing this well. Okay. And um, I'm meeting Pioneer on Monday. You know, like there's just a, like Dell have been really supportive to me. You know, there are companies doing it well. So let's give them a forum. Yeah. And so how can people get in touch with you, Kira? Sure. Well, workjuggle.com. That's where I am. Kira at workjuggle.com. And on social? And, and yeah, on Facebook and on Twitter as well. Okay. Well, Kira Garvin, CEO and founder of Workjuggle, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me.